America and, and get the money. And God will bless the Americans for giving them the money. And so they go back home and all they got is what they got. But the Americans who gave to them got greater and greater. And I said, I'm going to send Bibles around the world. I'm going to send money around the world. And I got blessed and blessed. And I told those in the church, I said, you know something? There are people who want to give me money from everywhere. But I want you to do it. Because when you do it, God's going to make you greater. And they found it to be true. And as they gave, they expanded. As they gave, they expanded. And now we're talking to the whole world. The Bible says the secret things belong to our God. Hallelujah. Yeah. So don't, don't, don't think it's not supernatural when you need something and somebody who knows you gives to you. Because God wants the people who are around you, who know you, He wants them to become great and mighty because they are the ones who support you. They'll support the vision. They'll support the things you do. They believe you. The stranger doesn't know. But if He gives to you, God has no option than to bless Him for giving to you. And then He gets great. And those around you remain small. And so you find that in many of those churches, they can't build what they need. They always need support from outside. All their members put together can't help anything. And the pastor just, he knows, he can see them, they're all poor. He looks at them like, Hey, oh God, you asked me to be here. I need money. And God will say, okay, call for so and so, they'll help you. And he calls somewhere else, and the money comes. And the ignorant brethren are very happy to see that somebody who didn't even know the pastor sent them money to build a church. And the pastor said, I was praying last night, and God told me, there's a man from nowhere who's coming to give you money for the building. And they came, and they're happy. They should be crying. Because God sent the blessing elsewhere. They should be crying. Are you getting this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. You find all the people who are associated with us, they just get greater and greater. That's I mean, the, there's just one thing about their lives. They get better and better, greater and greater. That's it. Because the word that God's given us empowers, uplifts, strengthens, and gives you a new picture. A great picture. So happy to see you. I love you. You're welcome. So good to see you. So you get that picture and you hold it up. As we look at that image that He's given us, we are changed, metamorphosed. Same thing you do everywhere. You Use what you've got. Think differently. Create thoughts of love, not of hate. What do I mean by that? I'm not even talking about um, maybe you hate somebody. I'm not even talking about because a lot of times we don't even hate somebody. But we're thinking about the one who hates us. We're thinking about the guy who doesn't like us. If they ever or somebody who didn't like you. I told you yesterday, be glad. If somebody cares enough about you to hate you, you must be important. There's a lot of people in the world, and they left all those people instead of hating you. You must be really cool. <laughs> Hallelujah. Say, I'm cool. I'm cool. Say, I know me. I may not know a lot of folks, but I got one to deal with. Say, I got one to deal with. And that's me. I know me. And I'm cool. Yeah. Think that way about yourself. Because God thinks so about you. He thinks you're cool. He really thinks so. You know why some people don't care how they look? 
They just go. They have a bad opinion of themselves. Clean up! Clean up! Have a tremendous opinion of yourself. Don't wait for somebody to give it to you. God already did so. Say, I'm great. I'm cool. Say it again, I'm great. I'm cool. See, only people who know they are great and cool can help others get great and cool. Right? Yeah. Okay, let's go for more. Ah, number three, language. Number one is what? Direction. Direction. Number two, vision. Number three, language. Give them new words. Love words. Positive words. Give them new words. You know, some people, they, they just got some, something nasty in their tongue. Give them new words. Can you see that man? That, 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 that short man. Short man? No, you, you don't describe someone as short. You say, what if he's not tall? Better to say not very tall than to say short. Don't you see that man? That, that man that comes to the church is kind of bent to the right. Bent to the right? Not kind at all. He's not bent. Look for something else to describe him with. Why must you describe others with the things that are negative about their image? Think of something else. Isn't there something else you can use? Wasn't there anything that was positive about him? So, language. You're helping them have a new kind of language. Teach them. I used to teach that in church. Now tell them, don't call people short. Yeah. I know there are people who even say that. They say, you know I'm short. They say it to themselves. But you see, the reason they say it is say, it's obvious. It's obvious. Everybody knows I'm short. Okay, hear me out, world. I'm short. <laughs> the reason you're saying it, you don't really like it. You're trying to, you know, accommodate yourself. You're trying to adjust to this something you're thinking, I can't change it. This is my height. Who cares? If others are taller than you, that doesn't mean you're not tall. You're tall. You're just not as tall as the others. We are all tall. Yeah. Why think that way about you? But you see, the problem there is not about height. It's about image. It's about a self-image. It's about us being bold about us. In confidence. And learning to look at things that help and build and strengthen rather than things that demean. Jesus made us. And He always wants us to look at the good side of life. Because He thinks we can change the other side when we look at the positive side. And become strengthened, we can change everything that's negative in our world. That's the way he thinks. And that's the way we should think. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give them new words. Teach them a new language, a new way of communicating. Yeah. Healing words. You teach those things in church. You realize a lot of times we're trying to teach things that the people don't even understand. And we find about those things for a long time trying to teach them and then and that, you know, they just let you talk. And year after year, those people haven't grown. Because what you taught them was not useful for growth. They couldn't apply it in their lives. Learn when to teach 
things for information. And learn when to teach things for life. The difference between the Pharisees and, and, and Pharisees and scribes will never help somebody grow. See what I mean? And you can explain the Greek and Hebrew, especially to people who never went to school, don't even understand English yet. And it's not changed their lives. They don't even have Bibles. And here you are saying, you see the Greek of the, you know, I teach Greek. I, I enjoy, you know, I, I'm, I, I study languages. So, it, it is, um, it's of natural uh, interest. Okay? So, um, I can teach what Hebrew and Greek, it just sticks. But I understand the guy who's not holding the Bible. He doesn't even have a Bible. And I'm explaining the Greek. And the Hebrew connotation. Just stretch your neck and see. He doesn't have a Bible. And he's like this looking at you. <laughs> he's not going to grow nowhere. He doesn't have any notes. He doesn't have a Bible. Doesn't know where you're talking from. When you finish, he could say, That was a wonderful message. <laughs> Did I ever tell you of Young Cho's story? An interesting story. I'll tell you again. <laughs> he said when he was a young pastor. And uh, at about this time, he probably had about 3,000 members or so. So, he began to study to become an erudite preacher. He wanted to know so much. So he was, and it's amazing that he would think so. Anyway, so, uh, he began to study to teach real philosophy. And one of these Sundays, one of the women brought her husband who had not been coming to church. And he turned out to be a professor of philosophy. <laughs> so, he was in the congregation and... Dr. Cho was preaching and teaching with big words and all of these philosophers and all their philosophizing. And when he was through, they went to the office and the woman brought her husband. Pastor, please, uh, meet my husband. And he was happy to meet the, the man. And then he said, ah, I hope you enjoyed the service. He said, to his amazement, he never heard anybody answer him so straight. The man said, I suffered throughout the service. <laughs> he said, why? He said, at that moment I felt like if God would bring down thunder to strike this man today. Because, you see, his ego was hurt. So he said, why? The man said, you know, all that time you were preaching elementary philosophy. He said, I'm a professor. But you're a young man, and I want to give you an advice. <laughs> he said to him, I may never come back to your church, but I want to advise you. Specialize in Bible. <laughs> That's what he told you. He said, specialize in Bible. And you'll be able to help others. And don't spend your time on philosophy. And that's how the man left. And Pastor Joe says he was there, not knowing what to do. <laughs> but he knew the man had told him the truth. And guess what? I heard that message years ago, while I was still a student. It came pretty early for me. And I said, Lord Jesus, if you... Had to send a professor to tell Pastor Chu that. You don't need to send me a professor. I take my lesson now. <laughs> I will specialize in Bible. <laughs> so I chose from then to specialize in Bible. <laughs> so pastors specialize in Bible. <laughs> See, it doesn't matter who you're preaching to. They don't want to know more about 
all these things in the world. There are people who have studied them. Something they don't know. It's about God. They want to know the spiritual. They want to know Him. They want to know Him. They want to know Jesus. Who is Jesus? Beyond what history has said about Him. Who is Jesus? They're looking for somebody who knows Him. Someone who can actually introduce Him. They're looking for that. And so when all these people come to your church every Sunday, and then on weekdays many of them come too, why do they come? They come because of the person of Jesus. So introduce Jesus. Make Jesus real to them. Let them get to meet the Master. The Master Himself. Wow. The last of this, number four, message. Number one is what? And number two? And number three? Now, number four, message. What do I mean by that? Give them a new message. Replace their message of hate and pain and frustration with yours of love and kindness. They got a message of pain. Message of hate. I hate this country. That's their message. I hate this country. You hate this country. Do I have a message for you? Can I change that message? My life is full of pain. He says, he's got a message of pain. That's all he's got. Oh, I've been trying to have children. I've been married 14 years. Don't have any child. Oh, can I change that message? Because this is the message he carries everywhere. He's, if he's got 14 years looking for a child, by now he has a sermon. It's a message of frustration. And he carries it everywhere. And he doesn't know why things go bad. Is that all your life is about? See, so, I've got to give them a new message. Something to talk about. Many don't know what to talk about. When they go out, they don't know what to discuss. They don't know what to talk about at work. They don't know what to talk about when they're out there. So, I want to put a message in their mouth. And it's my job. I'm going to introduce a new message. I'm going to give you a new message. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yep. So, what am I doing? In I'm helping them manage their mind. Manage their thinking. Think of your contribution as an assignment from God. What does that mean? Everything that you can add to another person's life. See it as an assignment. It's an assignment. It's an assignment. So I know what I can do. What I can be. I wrote this down for you. You can choose to bring joy and glory or choose to bring sarcasm moving to the next level, right? Okay. I read to you from Proverbs chapter 24 from verse Okay, because I know that the differences in the translations can be sometimes broad, I'm going to read first from my translation that I will read to you. 
it will get your attention, and then we'll look at it from whatever translation you might be using. Would that be fine? Okay. Any enterprise is built by wise planning, becomes strong through common sense, and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. Okay, haven't read that, I'm going to read it to you from some of the translations now. And I like this one, from the Amplified. So, the verse is number three. Proverbs chapter 24, in verse number three. I'm reading to you from, ver- from the Amplified Version. Through a skillful and godly, through skillful and godly wisdom is a house. Then it goes, a life, a home, a family built. And by understanding, it is established on a sound and good foundation. Verse 4 says, And by knowledge shall its chambers of every area be filled with all gracious, precious, and pleasant riches. That's nice. Right? This sounds like God, you know. He always tells us nice things. To make our lives beautiful. Doesn't sound like someone who's against us, does it? He's showing us secrets. He's showing us how to make things happen. He says, through skillful and godly wisdom is a house. Then it goes, a life, a home, a family. The other one that we read, is says, any enterprise. Through wisdom. You can build any enterprise. And by understanding, he says, it is established. See, it's one thing to build, it's another thing to have it established. And then, after building, he tells you, through knowledge, you're going to have the shambas filled with precious and pleasant riches. Hallelujah. You know what's going through my mind? I'm thinking about you. Hello? Look at that scripture. Now, three things. Wise planning. That's the first when I read to you from the from the Living Bible. He says, any enterprise is built through what? Wise planning. And that wise planning is skillful and what? Godly wisdom. So, we write down wisdom. What does this mean now? What does this wisdom refer to? Foresight, insight, and instruction. You write that down. Foresight, insight, and instruction. That's what God gives you. God gives you foresight. Then He gives you insight. Because first He shows you the vision. You look at something, and the picture that God's showing you of a possibility. Once you can accept it, He brings you into it. You know, in architecture, we can imagine what we want to design. The client says he wants X, Y, Z kind of house. And I'm thinking through what he's saying. 
and I'm now working out in my mind a concept. And I got a concept for him to look at, if you'd like it. And he likes it. And I go back to my desk and I have this thing on the drawing board, have it fully designed. And once I designed it, I actually walk in that house. I move from room to room. I understand how everything works, even though he's on the board. That's the way the architect is. The guy can't see it like that. He's looking at lines and curves. But I'm looking at a house. I'm literally inside the house. I know how the doors turn. I know how the things they work. It's all so beautiful to me. I got insights. I had foresight. Now I have insights. I'm living in the reality of it, even though the house is not on the ground yet. Then the next thing I do is the instructions for the building. Here's what God does for you. He says, any enterprise is built through wise blood. God the wisdom, he says. And so, I, I told you, I said, wisdom here that he's talking about has got to do with foresight, insight, and instruction. God gives you foresight. He's waiting for you to accept it. If you can accept the picture that He shows you, He brings you by the anointing into it, and you find you are walking in it. It's so real to you. It's God saying, showing you a church of 500 members or 5,000 members. You get the picture. It's foresight. Once you endorse it with Him, now you live in the reality of it. Once you can live in the reality of it, you're ready for number three, which is instruction. What is he saying to do? What is God telling you to do? At every point in time, he leads, he guides, he tells you, you do it like this and you do it like this, you're following his instruction. And as you follow his instruction, things are working. The enterprise is being built. It's being built. The life is being built. Glory to God. All right. Then he goes... In the Living Bible, he says, common sense. But that common sense is what we read, understanding. Understanding. By understanding, it is established. What is he talking about? Discretion. That's what it means. And that's why he called it common sense. He's talking about discretion. Discretion. God helps you. To have that discretion. You're thoughtful, inconsiderate. Because you're smart. But you're considered with the Holy Spirit. You have discretion. Because God leads you. And you're listening to Him. You're listening to Him. Praise God. Amen. Are you following? Okay. Then he goes to the third one. Can, can, we, can we go back to that living Bible where, where I read that to you? Because um, I think some of you are wondering where these are coming out of now. I read this to you. Any enterprise is built by wise planning. Become strong through common sense. I said, that's discretion. And profits wonderfully. Wonderfully. Hey, he says, it's going to work wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. Now, this is really important. He says, keeping abreast of the facts. That's what he saw, knowledge. That means he's talking about specialized knowledge. And, and keeping abreast of the facts means that, oh boy. Let me give this to you here. I wrote down here. I said, updating knowledge and instruction. Did you hear that? Yes. And what are you doing? Keeping abreast of the facts. Now, you, you're planning, let's assume you're planning for 
a program in church. Or even uh, a growth. Do you plan for growth? If you don't plan for growth, you don't get it. You have to plan for growth. Plan for growth. You say, um, look, at the, look at the last three months and how you've been growing. What are the numbers? Think about the numbers in the last three months. And when you understand the numbers for the last three months, you say, okay, now, for the next three months, I'm going to work like this, and in the third month, I want this figure. And this figure will become consistent. So, until you raise the dike. So what you do? You plan. Get your figures. Get your numbers. This is where we've been in the last three months. Don't just keep going to church and coming out of church and going to church and coming and hoping that things are going to happen. They don't happen like that. A pastor is not somebody who just... What did Jesus say? The Son of Man is come to seek and to save. We are only jumping on the last one. Save. What about the seeking part? To seek and to save that which was lost. But you're waiting in church and hoping to save them when they come. When are you going to seek them? A pastor who's not seeking them doesn't have a program for seeking the lost. He's not ready for growth. He's not ready for growth. Have a plan. Have a plan for growth. Have a plan for growth. See, let me tell you something. You've you got to... Um, take seriously. When we minister, we minister to people always under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Whether we're ministering healing or we're ministering uh, some grace into that one's life. Well, whatever it is that we are imparting, we can only do through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Okay? But you see, we don't have control over that. I don't have control over the gifts of healing, for example. I don't have control over it. I only learn from the Word and through working with the Holy Spirit what to do to be ready for it more often. And so that I can have it for use. But I can't make it come and go. But I can do things that will encourage its work. Are you getting it? So the gifts of God are given by the Holy Spirit's own discretion. They are the workings of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But He does something that's within our control. He gives us His words for our knowledge and our faith. And so we can act on His word anytime, anywhere, for any purpose, and have results. Can you see that? We can. So, there are, I said that because of this, there are things that can happen supernaturally and then you just have seen growth. And if you, if you have studied revivers, what they call revivers in history, you would know that those things have happened many times. The, the ones that came because people were praying and they were praying and seeking God and then you know, there was this outpouring that came. There were those that happened without anybody knowing exactly what happened. It just, it just happened. And people just started coming in. And, but there's something that Charles Grandison Finney said that was very remarkable. He said, after many years of having revivals, he had come to understand that there were principles to follow if you wanted to have an outpouring of the Spirit in any city. And he said he was sure, he could guarantee that he could have it in any city where he chose to. It's like the man who said, 
it appears that God will do nothing for man except we pray. Why did he say it appears? Because he had studied the whole subject and there seemed to be a consistency. So Finney thought that there was a consistency of asking and receiving. Seeking and finding. Knocking and having the door open. That's what it's about. So a pastor who's not waiting for chance, because he don't want no chance, you don't know if that chance is going to come. But he gave you the power, the ability, and the responsibility to make it happen. Why wait? If I know what to do, I can do it. Why wait? So I'm going to do it. So you make the choice. These things are the things you're going to do. I'm going to set a pace. I want to change the level of our growth. Pastor, if you had a business, if you entrusted somebody with a business, and that business was a hundred units of whatever it was, and after two years you came back, it's still a hundred units, it's time to fire the guy. If you are not growing, why don't you think that the master should fire you? And if you don't know he has a principle of firing people, I'll tell you how. Study his word. He does fire his workers. You know how he fires them? It's very simple. He has two ways. Kick you out of there. Or start a new thing and forget about you. So that while you're playing church and wasting your time, he does something serious. He said the kingdom of God has a man who had planted his vine and then there was no fruit on it. Nothing will happen. So he came one day, looked at it and said, um, this thing, there's still no fruit on it. Then he called his laborers. He said, cut it down. And they said, Master, can we just give it one or two more seasons? I will dig around it and we'll put some manure in it and... Um, if it doesn't work, we can cut it down. Then I said, alright. Did you hear that? Who knows? If, you're, if you are just having the two seasons left. He wants fruit on it! He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he cut it. Cuts it off. And he says, and, and they're burned. He takes it away. So, you shouldn't be there thinking it's nice. You know, we've got these 300 members. And uh, for how long have you been 300 members? You think it's nice to just be 300 members? It's about time to grow. It's time to grow. Become growth conscious and you have it. Being growth conscious is not, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh. Can I hear him tell us a funny story about a man who was little, God, move, Lord, move, some way, somehow. And Ken Hagen said he was listening to the man praying. And he said, move, Lord, move, Lord. And he was thinking, what do you want God to move to do what? Move, oh Lord. Move, oh Lord. Some way, somehow. Move in our church. Some way, somehow. And then he said, he finally concluded, by a hook or by a crook, Lord. <laughs> and he said, the Lord doesn't move by a hook and crooks. Some way, somehow. God should just move. Some way, somehow. And that's ignorance. It's not going to move some way somehow. He moves by the Word and the Holy Ghost. Say this with me. I can grow anywhere. I'm anointed to have results. Don't forget it. It says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruits. Bring forth fruits. That's my commission. I bring forth fruits. Listen, don't just think it. You've got to say it. It's got to become a consciousness for you. Every day, everywhere. 
I bring forth fruits. I'm anointed to produce results. I'm a fruit bearing branch. I am. I am. See, I got the consciousness. I am. I am. Maybe when we close and you stand in front of the mirror, you talk to the guy on the other side of the mirror and say, You are a fruit bearing branch. I know who you are. Talk to yourself. You stand in front of the mirror, you say, You are a success happening everywhere. Hallelujah. I'm going to multiply, I'm going to multiply, I'm going to multiply, I'm going to multiply, 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 multiply my abilities, multiply everything God's given to me. I'm going to return, multiply, a harvest. A harvest, right? Hmm. Keeping abreast of the facts. See, you gotta follow it up. It's that's dealing with follow up. Keeping abreast of the facts. You know, uh, when we work on anything, uh, folks, I tell them you gotta follow, monitor the process, and be ready to make changes on along the way. Keeping abreast of the facts. Monitor the process. Because you want to be successful. Don't just have a dream and say, okay, we set a target. We're going to make this thing in three months' time. What are you going to do between now and then to ensure that when the day comes, you got your results? You don't just say, well, in three months' time, we believe we're going to be this. How many times have you said it and how many times did it work? If it didn't work, it was because you didn't work it. You're supposed to work it. Have your process. Now, this is what you're going to do. Lord, you know, the Lord's showing you. He's giving you foresight. He's giving you the picture. So you know, between here and there, that's where I'm going. That's where we're going to be. In three months' time, that's where we're going to be. But between here and there, I'm not so sure what to do. Dear Lord, what are the instructions? In my, ex- my experience with God, is that many, many times before I pray, he's answered. It's what Jesus said. A lot of times, before my knees hit the floor, he's spoken. So now I go on, I go ahead and I pray, not because of what I wanted to pray about. He already spoke. So I'm so glad and I'm thankful. I found many times. I'm thinking of something I want to talk to the Lord about. And I'm ready to go pray. And before I start, sometimes I just say, Heavenly Father, and I, uh, He's spoken to me. It's been my experience through the years. So I find that I don't, I, I don't have to convince Him. I don't have to try to make Him do anything. I'm walking on destiny. And you should think like that. That's why he sent me to you. See, so that you can understand. It's that message which he opened your heart to accept that it's true. Destiny. He has a life plan. See, and it's a good plan. It's an excellent plan. It's a wonderful plan. And all you have to do is receive his foresight and get into it and have the insight and listen for his instructions and just walk your way through and have a glorious ride with the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, now lastly here, Proverbs chapter 22 and this one verse. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 
29. Do you like verse 29? You like it when you see it. All right, can you all read it for me? Want to go? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Read it again. One more time. He says, have you seen a man that's diligent in his business? You shall stand before kings. What does it mean by... Now, if you, if you study different translations, you find that they have uh, suggestive words to mean to tell us that um, this man will serve before kings. But that's not the picture. You see, the, the picture, really, the word that's translated stand there, yourself, it actually means to set oneself in a position. It means to set oneself in place. And where it uses the word before, it actually means in presence of. So it means that a man who is diligent will set himself in presence of kings. What does that tell you? Among kings. He bring himself into that place among kings. That's what he's saying. And when God talks about kings, He's not just talking about some guy with a crown on his head. He's talking about authority. He's talking about rulership. He's talking about a place of dominion. Whether he's in an industry, whether he's in a... Whatever it is, he brings you into a place of dominion. He says, have you seen a man diligent in his business? As a pastor, are you diligent in your business? Are you diligent in this work? Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. Samuel said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in neglecting to pray for you. You have to pray for the people who are under you. It's a responsibility. If Samuel thought it was a sin against God to not pray for them, it would be a sin against God for you not to pray for them. You have to pray for them. You have to pray for those over whom you pastor. Are you diligent as a pastor? Are you focused on this thing? Listen, if you're a pastor, focus on your pastorate. It's important. Focus on your pastorate. Focus on your pastor. If you're a pastor, be diligent. Be diligent. Make it a priority. It, it's, it's not something that you do partly. It's got to be a priority. Focus on the pastor. Focus on it if you're a pastor. Pastoral work is not part time. Everything else can be part time. But focus on it. Give it attention. Give it attention. Even to think about what Jesus did is more than enough for us to realize how important this is. Why? Okay. The Bible tells us. That Jesus Christ bought us with the price of his own blood. You remember how Paul counseled the leaders of Ephesus before he left them. And he thought he'd never see them again. Alright? He called the church the flock which Christ bought with his own blood. And he made them understand how serious that was. And so if those people are placed under you, 
is serious business. It's very important. So no matter what you do, God gives you the grace. Okay? He gives you the grace. For everything that you have to do, He gives you the grace. But learn the priority. Learn the priority. A church whose pastor treats the pastorate as a, a part-time assignment cannot grow. The church requires attention. And, for example, when you, like you're here now, you're, you took a trip from wherever you, 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 you've been to come here. This is in connection with the work. So it's a good one. It's a good journey because you go back and you do better. It's in light of it. So that's the right journey. But there are pastors who have no... Their schedule is such that they cannot attain to the congregation. The church cannot grow if you act like that. The church cannot grow. You want the church to grow? You've got to do something. Give it attention. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? It is, he shall stand before kings. He shall set himself in the presence of kings. That means he'll be among kings. Then, surprisingly, I said surprisingly, the second part of that same verse, he says, he shall not set himself among the term mean men. Do you know what that means? I didn't know God would say that. I didn't know God thought like that. The word is nobody's. So God thinks some people are nobodies? Dear Lord, is that possible? Mine, oh my. Nobody's? Lord Jesus. Is that possible? I want to find out. Why would God talk like that? This is, seest thou a man diligent in his business? This is, he shall stand before kings and not before mean men. Obscure. This is insignificant. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. God is saying there are people who don't count. Why? Solomon calls them vain men. Vain. Meaning that they're empty. What they say doesn't matter. What they do doesn't matter. That's what it means. Not that they're men of no value, but what they say has no value. And God says, hey, the value of your personality comes out in your words. And if your words are without value and are vain, He says, first, you pay for it. Jesus said, for every, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall be judged. Because you are of value and you have devalued yourself. So those nobodies were not made nobodies by anybody. They made themselves nobodies. They became vain men. Their words were useless. And if your words are useless, your thoughts are useless, and therefore what? Your actions are useless. And God says, a diligent person will not set himself among those who are mean, vain, and insignificant. Do you want to be insignificant in your society? No. You want to be able to change things. You want to be able to order things. You want to be able to bring glory to the Master, Jesus Christ. It's your job. It's your responsibility. And you're going to do it. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Okay, now I'm out of time for sure. Okay? Yeah. Say yes.
Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm telling you this again to tell me, yes, praise God.